Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Great. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity to present my work at this nice conference. Uh, I too am looking forward to being able to travel again. Uh, it would be very nice to come to Russia once more. But today I will be discussing something a bit different. Uh, I will be talking about uh, DNA molecules and particular bubbles or breathers, and basically doing some sort of discussion of how we can use uh, nonlinear dynamics in these real world biological systems, uh, such as we have seen uh, earlier from Dr. Goyanov as well. So this will be a little less mathematical than some of the previous ones, but hopefully it will be an enjoyable uh, story through biology and uh, nonlinear dynamics. So this work is in collaboration with uh, my supervisor, Professor Skogos, as well as George Kolosikas and Alan Bishop. So to start with, we will give some descriptions of how DNA works, what DNA is for, how it works, what it does, and then move on to the nonlinear letter side, how we can look at DNA as simply a physical mathematical object, and then into breathers and uh, stationary soliton type uh, dynamics in DNA, looking at some properties of bubbles, and then finally linking the two worlds of biology with the transcription to nonlinear dynamics with the bubbles and breathers. That's that's the story of, of my talk. Firstly, well, let's ask ourselves what is DNA? What is this thing that we are, are looking at? And very simply, we basically have these two strands of, of bases which are bonded together into this kind of double helix form. So we have four possible bases, which we can have find, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. This is nice, only four bases, so far so good. And even better, they can only form in these pairs of AT and GC. So we have simply this double helix, we have some sugar backbone and some phosphate, but you know we are mathematical physicists, so we do not worry too much about the actual biological details, as long as we can get the dynamics accurately modeled. So we're just gonna concern ourselves with these base pairs, which are AT and GC. And what's of course important about these base pairs is that these encode genetic information. So these base pairs in the sequence tell us about the genes that we're going to be creating from this DNA. So we have the so-called genetic alphabet formed from simply these base pairs. We have AT and GC base pairs, two kinds of base pair. These give us the binary alphabet of how amino acids are encoded. And these amino acids are then uh, the things that actually create physical proteins, actual biological tissue. Uh, and that is kind of how the sequence goes from the genetic information of the DNA uh, to these proteins. But the important thing that we want to take away here is that the sequence of these bases, although it is simply a binary alphabet of AT and GC, two kinds of base pairs, it's simple, but very, very, very important. This is how all of our genetic information is encoded. That's quite phenomenal. But then the question is, how do we go from this world of information, the, the alphabet, to an actual physical biological cell? Uh, and this, this is the side which we are much more comfortable with, you know, the idea of some, some alphabet, some, you know, we can do some combinatorial studies, we can figure out probability distributions and study the properties of these, of the, of these uh, base pairs as sort of information objects. But then how does this go to the actual biology? And the important thing that is that the information needs to be communicated. And so how this communication happens uh, between the DNA strands and the actual proteins is through the process of transcription. So what is transcription? Transcription is when the DNA strands communicate the genetic code, which is the sequence of base pairs, to a messenger strand, the mRNA, which uh, might be familiar from some of the uh, talking about vaccines at the moment, which is quite interesting. Um, and so this mRNA then links the DNA to the actual uh, amino acid peptide synthesis. Basically, the mRNA is the, the communication link between the DNA and the cells. And this is how our body does this amazing thing of turning information into actual physical tissue. And so in this process of transcription, what happens? Well, we have this double helix 
of DNA, but DNA is fundamentally closed. If it was open, we'd have all sorts of things breaking off and falling apart. So in order for the DNA to actually be able to communicate with the outside world, it has to separate, it has to open up and allow the mRNA, the messenger strand, to communicate with the DNA itself. So what happens is that the DNA opens up in this sort of bubble, uh, this breather soliton-like structure, under the influence of an enzyme. So we have some, some protein which comes along, this RNA polymerase, and it opens up the DNA double strand, and then this mRNA is able to copy the upper sequence or lower sequence, either the sequences from the DNA strand, and it then disappears off and communicates back to the cells. So again, this makes sense. DNA opens and it copies to the what single strand RNA. Great. But how does this enzyme know where to bind? How does it know where to start encoding the gene? Why does it not just you know, encode a whole bunch of random nonsense? I mean, we have many, many uh, DNA strands in our bodies and many, many genes. How does the uh, enzyme know where to start? And so of course, there are some very nice uh, markers in the DNA. Uh, and there are things like a transcription factor, but it's also a dynamical element, which is what we're going to be getting at now. Because as soon as we see this idea of an opening in the double strand, we're already thinking in dynamical systems, this is something that we can actually understand. So let's get into the model. How are we going to model this DNA? We have this incredibly complicated biological molecule, but from our point of view, we can actually make it quite simple. So to refresh the basics, we have this double helix structure, strands held together by base pairs, and we have simply two types of base pair, AT and GC. Dynamically now, what's important is that the AT base pairs form two hydrogen bonds, and GC base pairs form three hydrogen bonds between them. So in AT base pair, we know we're going to have a weaker bonding than in GC. So this, of course, is important when you're going to model our forces later. So for a simple model, which is accurate, um, but useful, and sort of able to encode the necessary information, we're going to use the Perard Bishop Doxwa model, which was developed in the 90s and has been very effective in mathematically and physically modeling the dynamics of DNA. So, what we do is we simply take this double strand. We kind of ignore the twisting because dynamically we can get away with this by some clever use of parameters. And so, we're just going to consider it as this kind of ladder of base pairs with nearest neighbor coupling and some on site potential. Uh, we can also if we want to, we can simplify whether it's AT or TA and just bunch them all together. Two hydrogen bonds, three hydrogen bonds, ignore these details. We'll take these both into account, but we have this, this extremely simple option of just this straightforward ATGC. Good. And now finally an equation. The Hamiltonian we're going to use to study this uh, molecule is defined by obviously the kinetic energy and this potential. So we have an on-site Morse potential, which gives us the interaction between the bases themselves. And we have this nice uh, repulsion attraction sort of picture, which might be familiar from you know, various uh, parts of molecular physics, particle physics. And we have this Morse potential and a coupling potential. And this is in large part is where the magic happens because here we account for all kinds of uh, complex interactions in this very simple nonlinear term, we can simplify it further and take a linear term and study all kinds of soliton solutions and so on. But in order to accurately model biological facts, this nonlinearity is extremely important. Further, we can consider this to be the same for all base pairs, or we can add an extra sequence dependence, which is quite subtle, but very important for physical uh, reproduction of results, of experimental results. And so it's very good for accurate modeling. We can add this sneaky little extra index to allow for a sequence dependence in this coupling. Fine. But moral story, we have reduced the extreme complexity of DNA to this simple potential. Great. So now what we want to do is, of course, study the biological phenomena, this transcription idea, with our nonlinear dynamics. How can we marry these two into this interesting problem? And the idea is that, all right, so the transcription has some moving opening in the double strand. This is how the 
the communication occurred, fine, and it's operated by the enzyme. The enzyme is the, the molecule responsible for opening up the strand, but it's still dynamical. We have some sort of motion between the base pairs, and it's not purely driven by the enzyme. There has to be some sort of thermal fluctuation going on. And importantly, it has actually been shown that the dynamics of these molecules affect the transcriptional activity. And especially if the DNA molecule has on its own, apart from the enzyme, just the DNA molecule has a probability of long-lived openings near where the transcription starts, this impacts the rate of transcription. So what we have is this relationship between long-lived bubbles, long-lived breathers, and transcription. And so this is where we will eventually focus. So first, let's have a brief look at these bubbles, breathers, and these thermally induced openings can occur naturally in DNA, and we call them bubbles. You know, very simple, we have a, a bubble in our, our sequence, our strand. And these are spontaneous. Uh, we can have a completely sort of isolated double strand of DNA, and if it's at non-zero temperature, these separations will occur. However, they are dramatically more prevalent at higher temperatures. So as you get to sort of physiological body temperature and slightly above, we find many, many more of these bubbles occurring. So let's try and understand these bubbles a bit more. So what we are going to do is we're going to take our Hamiltonian and we're going to perform numerical simulations. We're going to perform many, many, many numerical simulations to build up a picture of what is happening with the dynamics of these molecules. So we're going to take our PBD Hamiltonian, we're going to perform some constant energy simulations, integrate using synthetic integration techniques to make sure that you know, the long time integrations are necessary for accurate uh, statistical physics. Uh, we know that our integration is accurate for long times from the symplectic methods. And we're going to do a, a variety of, of studies. We're going to look at general uh, arbitrary sequences to develop a baseline of what's going on, and then look at some actual biological, viral and bacterial promoter sequences. And of course, what we can do, the advantage of these numerical experiments, that what we're doing is simulating and integrating the positions and momenta. So by integrating the positions, we automatically are able to keep track of the displacements. And since those are our dynamical variables, we have a, a rec full record of the displacements of these base pairs. So we can make some, some nice plot like this, where we track the displacement of individual base pairs, function of time at each site. And so we can get some idea of what's going on. And even this plot for itself, is somewhat suggestive that we have openings occurring in various places where we have the lighter color. But well, it's interesting, this is not exactly what we're looking for, because what we want to study is the properties of bubbles, not necessarily displacements on their own. So then, well, in our, our world of nonlinear dynamics, what is a bubble? And a bubble is simply a sequence of open base pairs, consecutive open base pairs, so L open base pairs then we'll call it a bubble of length L. And in the extreme case of a bubble, let's uh, take it to the extreme, we have the entire double strand separating, and this is called melting. So if no base pairs are stuck together any longer, we have a melted or denatured double strand. The question, however, what is the threshold for considering base pairs to be separated? If you go to a, a biological lab and you ask them, to tell you the percentage of open base pairs in the sequence. They'll put it into some ultraviolet light and measure some absorption and tell you, ah, yes, we have 25% open. But that is based on some sort of extra properties which we don't have access to from the dynamics. So what we need is to find a number to say, okay, if the displacement is greater than this number, we can consider this base pair to be open. And fortunately, we are able to do this by considering the definition of melting. And this definition of melting is that a DNA molecule is considered melted or denatured when exactly half of the base pairs are separated. So what we can do is we can run a whole bunch of simulations. We know what the melting temperature of these sequences are thanks to experiments and previous work. And we can find a threshold which meets this criterion. If we use too small a threshold, we'll have too many open base pairs at the melting point. If we use too big a threshold, 
we'll have you know, only five base pairs open when we're supposed to have many hundreds. So finding the perfect balance, we get these thresholds here, which is very nice actually. If you look at the, the plot here, what we find is that we have the fraction of open base pairs being exactly 50% at the known melting temperatures. So this is great. And these, uh, these values also have some correspondence to the on-site potential parameters. So it makes a lot of sense in the context of the model where we get these numbers from. We also have a different number for 80 base pairs and GC base pairs, which corresponds to the fact that 80 base pairs, remember, only two hydrogen bonds, therefore are much more likely to separate. And in order to produce these accurate results, uh, considering separate threshold values makes a lot of sense. Good. So now we are able to, instead of just track the displacements, we can track whether base pairs are open or closed. And that is the critical criterion for our bubbles. Now, what you want to do is to look at some properties of these bubbles. Okay, great. We can track them and we can identify here's a bubble, there's a bubble. What do we want to do with this? We want to know, okay, well, what's the probability of a bubble of length L occurring? Do we get lots of long bubbles? Do we get lots of short bubbles? Um, you know, how often do they occur? And furthermore, what's unique to the dynamics of the situation, something that you, it's very, very hard to do in the lab and you can't do with any sort of equilibrium physics, uh, Monte Carlo, for instance, simulations, is the lifetime. So as soon as we're looking at lifetimes, it becomes a uniquely dynamical problem. And so what we want to do is study these uh, probabilities and these lifetime distributions as a function of the composition, uh, because we know that the GC and AC ba AT base pairs are important to the biological phenomenon. So we want to study the effects of that. And then we look for a general background and finally move on to particular biological sequences. So let's ask ourselves the question, you know, how rare are large bubbles? You know, maybe these large bubbles are necessary for, for transcription would happen all the time. In which case, well, there's nothing special here. And the question is how long do they live for? Uh, do they typically live for long enough for the enzyme to know to bind there? Is it common for them to live long? And what effect does the base pair disorder have on this, right? Because the disorder in our system is introduced purely by these two kinds of, of sites in our lattice, so to say, the base pairs. Um, and in some sense, it's a very simple disorder, but very important to the dynamics. So let's get some results. So now we perform a whole bunch of simulations and find some nice uh, uh, results. We get after the Thermalizing our lattice from some initial conditions, we can record the number of bubbles that we find. So what we see here is simply the probability distribution or the distribution for a given site being in a bubble of length L. All right, so we showed it here for two different models. Let's quickly just focus on this, this first plot, which is for the non-sequence dependent model. And we can see that for a bubble in inverted commas of length one, we have some probability around 10 to the minus one. So there are quite a lot of, of these bubbles. But as we look for longer and longer bubbles, you know, more and more base pairs sequentially consecutively open, the probability drops dramatically in the log scales we can see. And we see very similar results. If we allow for some more detailed modeling of the sequence, we have slightly more bubbles due to the nature of the model, but we see exactly the same behavior where we have, in fact, a stretched exponential um, probability distribution for bubbles occurring. And our main takeaways here are that large bubbles are exponentially rare events. For instance, if we wanted to find some bubble of length 10, depending on exactly the number of GC or 80 base pairs, we have a very, very low probability of finding such a bubble. And also the more GC base pairs we have in our sequence, the fewer bubbles we have. So these are our, our primary takeaways from this background study of bubble probabilities. And just for information, we can of course perform these fittings of, for this stretched uh, exponential. And this allows us to estimate without having to redo the data, we can just estimate nicely the probability of finding a bubble of a given length of a given GC percentage. 
So that's just quite nice to be able to do quickly without having to refer back to the data. So then perhaps the more interesting, actually I think definitely the more interesting question is how long do bubbles typically live for? Um, what, what, what kind of information can we extract from the dynamics about the bubble lifetimes? And so for a given bubble length L, we can study the distribution of these lifetimes. And we know that long-lived bubbles have been associated with enhancing transcription activity. So these are things that we want to look out for. And we want to know what is the baseline for these bubbles so that we can compare our final uh, particular results to these sort of more general sequences. So if we can fire ahead again, perform our simulation. And of course, for studying the bubble lifetimes, we need very detailed, accurate, simulations to make sure that we are following exactly the evolution of these bubbles. So we need to track some very fine grained time steps to make sure that we have a, a good distribution. And what you can do is then record every bubble that we find, find its length in terms of base pairs and find its lifetime. And then we can histogram all these bubbles into these nice plots and remember that I said, of course, that bubbles are very rare events. So in order to have statistical soundness, it's important to have a large number of, of statistics. Otherwise, you can say, ah, well, you are reporting statistics in some exponentially rare event. How can we trust this? You do need very good statistics. So for length one bubbles, again, inverted commas, bubbles, it is just a single base pair. There's not so much of a bubble. We have this very interesting uh, distribution where we find that we have these sort of peaks uh, for different short lifetimes before slowly flattening out. Uh, and this is just telling us that very much these single base pair sort of oscillations, these breathers are very dependent on the disorder and the exact arrangement of the base pairs. And we get some, some strange behavior there. But soon, even if we go to length two bubbles, these peaks start flattening out, although they are still uh, appearing in the distribu distribution we start settling down towards once more a stretched exponential distribution for the bubble lifetime. So clearly from, from these, we have a lot of short-lived bubbles and fewer long-lived bubbles. As we increase the bubble length, so we can look at length one, length two, and so it can be more interesting in length three and then even length 10 bubbles, so 10 consecutive open base pairs, we find that we get more and more relatively more short-lived bubbles and fewer and fewer longer lived bubbles. And we sort of completely get rid of these this double peak structure as we go to longer bubbles. And once again, we can fit some nice parameters to the stretch potential to give a, a general idea of, okay, this is our baseline for how bubble lifetimes look. And again, we have some good dependence on L and some strong dependence on the GC percentage. So unsurprisingly, the, the disorder in the system plays a big role in the dynamics, which is what we would have expected coming in. Um, and also what we're noticing here is that long-lived bubbles are in some sense double exponentially rare in that the occurrence probability is exponentially small and also the lifetimes decrease exponentially. So for, for long-lived bubbles, the lifetime probability of such lifetimes is exponentially small. What we also want to look at is the average bubble lifetime. You know, we want one number to compare, okay, what is the typical lifetime for a bubble in such a sequence? And so what we can do is we can compute this. Uh, we have a distribution. We can, of course, compute the, compute the mean of this distribution. And we get some nice relationship depending on the length of the bubble. And for short bubbles, we have some longer lifetimes and it decreases. And by the time we get to sort of eight, 10 base pair long bubbles, it is more or less flattening out. So again, large bubbles tend to have shorter lifetimes and the GC content. So the, con the disorder, the base pair composition has a very significant effect on this lifetime. So for instance, this pure 80, so the GC percentage is zero. We have something on the order of uh, 0 0.22 picosecond average lifetime. Whereas for a pure GC sequence, that's going down to 0 0.15. So it's a very significant effect Despite, remember, allowing for different thresholds for these different uh, base pairs, we still get some significant variance 
the lifetime. So finally, let's actually look at some, some, some juicy biological sequences, some experimentally studied ones. And so now we will look at specific bubble lifetimes instead of just general background uh, arbitrary random sequences. And we're going to focus now on particular sites. So before we averaged over the entire ensemble of different, uh, different sequences, different base pairs, different sites, doesn't matter. But now we're looking at a specific sequence which is known, and we know that at certain points in the sequence, we have biological significant events. And so these binding sites, which is where the enzyme needs to know to bind, is where we're expecting to see some sort of dynamical signature. And so what we're going to do is find results for, for two promoters. So we're going to take a, a viral promoter, the P5, and a bacterial promoter, the DAC operon, and we're going to compare. We're going to take a nice transcriptional transcriptionally active P5 promoter, look at this bubble profile, it's the bubble lifetime profile, and then we're going to mutate it. We're going to say, okay, what happens if we take something which kills the transcription activity, experimentally uh, found sequence, so we have a transcriptionally active and transcriptionally inhibited version, and so we're going to study, do we see some dynamical signature of that? And then we'll do the opposite, and we'll take a transcriptionally active lac operon, and instead of killing the transcription, we're going to enhance the transcription and see, well, does that show up anything in the dynamics? Fine. So for the P5 promoter, this is some associated with, associated with some adenoviruses. We know that the transcription start site, which is marked as site one in all these plots, is important. And we know that long-lived bubbles here are significant. So here we can find, after some exhaustive uh, simulations, we can find up to length 10 bubbles, the bubble lifetime with the lifetime in picoseconds according to the bar at these different sites. So the white, black and white bar at the top just shows GC base pairs and DAC in 18 white, so we have an idea of the sequence. And we see that we have some peaks here and some bigger peaks up and downstream. So then, all right, so we clearly have some, some bubbles forming here. It's not perhaps uh, astonishing, but what you want to see is what happens when we mutate. So if we flip some of these base pairs, just two base pairs um, near the transcription start site, which cuts off the transcription activity. So now if we send the enzyme, uh, nothing is happening. What do we see here? So here we have the wild type and here we have the mutant. And just some small change here. We can definitely see that uh, the, the red color is not so prevalent here, but maybe if I were to show you these plots, you would not be convinced. What do we see? So let's quantify this difference, right? We have some good statistics. We trust our results. Let's find the relative difference between the mutation and the wild type. So here, we just compute the relative difference of the site type, and we plot that. And now, some clear difference that the bubble lifetimes at the transcription start site and downstream the transcription start site, we have distinctly suppressed bubble lifetimes. So now we are seeing what we wanted to see, which is this correlation that when we have an inhibited transcription, we have shorter bubble lifetimes in this region. In some sense, it is not extremely surprising, but it's interesting how strong an effect just a couple of tweaked base pairs has on the dynamics. And so then quickly, let's look at the, the opposite. What happens if we take a different promoter? Um, you know, of course, we want some variety. We want to say, okay, well, we have shown it for one, one sequence. This is true all the time. We can take a bacterial promoter, we'd move away from a virus to bacteria, and now we strengthen the transcription instead of inhibiting it. So now we're going to look at the LAC operon, which has uh, what's called sigma, sigma factor binding sites at minus 30 and minus 10, these are sites here and here. And this is a slightly longer sequence, and we definitely have plenty of long lived bubbles here, here, and here. And so this is near the uh, the first uh, minus 30 site, and here we have some, some bubbles at the, the minus 10 site, and we're going to now boost this transcription factor at, at uh, site minus 10. We're going to flip some base pairs again, which we know enhances the transcriptive, transcriptive activity, and we're going to see, okay, again, I'm going to show you these plots. We see some, some differences, fine, but we want to see the relative difference, and again, we see that now, when we boost the transcriptive, transcriptive activity, we get longer lifetimes. 
In fact, a 30% longer lifetime of these bubbles forming near this important site. So this is nice. So we have this correlation that dynamics and transcription are related in this uh, light bubble lifetime. And we have some longer lived bubbles at enhanced transcription. And if we have short lived bubbles, that corresponds to inhibited transcription. So now we have finally this link between the nonlinear dynamics of the bubble lifetime and the biological transcription. So the takeaway from all of this is that, yes, we can learn some useful things about biology by looking at nonlinear dynamical models. And I've looked uh, with our, we have looked in our group with at this uh, idea of breathers and bubbles in DNA sequences. And again, we have this idea, which is prevalent throughout you know, all the nonlinear modeling of, of physical systems, this order and nonlinearity. And we found that this order definitely affects our probabilities and lifetimes of bubbles. And it's this interplay between nonlinearity and disorder, which produces the, the important non long lived bubbles, um, which is sort of showing the power of nonlinear modeling, where we can actually have some understanding of these biological events due to those, uh, those terms and the potential. So thank you everyone for listening. Okay, let's thank the speaker for such an interesting talk. Are there any questions? Okay, I think I have a question sure. because I actually worked in this area a long, long time ago. So apologies in advance if my question sounds out of date or just downright silly. Now, uh, the, uh, the stretch exponentials that you uh, obtained as a fit, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, often obtained in various kinetic uh, models of uh, disordered systems. And your bubbles, I think they, they can be viewed as some sort of excitations, right? Um, so have you tried to understand the statistical mechanics or kinetics of uh, bubbles? Because obviously, you know, your uh, computational work is quite substantial, but then you, you've got lots of parameters, I assume, right? And you want to um, reduce the number and see how, you know, how you can understand your, 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 your results using ana simple analytical models. The reason I'm asking this question is because I remember the work of one of your collaborators, Alan Bishop, it was, I think, late 70s. Yeah, 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 it was this uh, paper when, where they tried to go from the nonlinear uh, models of coupled oscillators to statistical mechanics of uh, solitonic like excitations. And I'm not going to say that that's the way you can follow, obviously. Uh, as I said, I'm out of date, but certainly the stretch exponentials, you know, they, they, they for example, well started, this, this kind of stretch exponential behavior is well started in uh, non-equilibrium non uh, statistical mechanics in particular st statistical mechanical models of systems with systems of amorphous media like i'm talking about glass transition for example so yes, yes. so you can you can actually look into various transitions and as i said apply some simple and well, maybe not so simple analytical models Yes, no, thank you. Sorry if it sounded like a comment rather than a question. It is both. It just, just, just your work brings some, some memories. I remember they tried to understand this AZ transitions in DNA, if I, if I recall the term correctly. Yes, yeah, so certainly there are some, there's, there are several studies. So there's some interest, and of course, the, the phrase transition is an obvious, interesting. Uh, property of this model where we have a, a phase transition in a one-dimensional model. Uh, there's also some, some study of this, this glass phase, so to say, um, at low temperatures, uh, which I, I don't, I'm trying to recall now. I think I've seen some mention of that. But definitely, yes, um, there, there's, there's a lot more that we could try and figure out in terms of these 
stretched exponentials and yeah the, the kinetics and the the lifetimes that's a good point thank you okay thank